And for the umpteenth year, we welcome the National Athletic Trainers Association. And it is athletic trainers, not trainers. Guys, girls, get that right, please. Uh, they've been one of our most loyal sponsors, and we owe them a debt of gratitude. Uh, we ask that you go to their website, nata.org. Anything, any questions you have on sports medicine related issues, they are the go-to people. Ellen Satloff, who is in the magenta, pink. What color is that? Magenta, we're going with magenta. If you have any questions, she's a great resource for you. Uh, one of the things they do is the uh, sports medicine related reporting award. I'd like to congratulate our winner who's here with us and we'll hear from her in a minute. Morgan Fogarty, welcome who is from just down the road at Fox Charlotte. But right now I'd like to introduce a guy who is our liaison to NATA. He is the head athletic trainer at Catawba College, a longtime host here with NSSA, and uh, one of our favorite people here, and he got the blue shirt memo today, I'm glad. Bob Kazmus, give it up for Bob. Thanks, Bob. Where's Dr. Young? This is my Carolina Blue, Dr. Young, just so you know that. I know, you, I know you're the Duke Blue guy, but Carolina Blue runs in my, I married a Carolina girl, I have to, I have to wear Carolina Blue. But anyway, this is the, actually, this is the 10th sports medicine seminar being presented by the NATA. I'm a member of the NATA and a proud certified athletic trainer. I do want to introduce to you our, uh, our head table, who are, the folks are here representing the National Athletic Trainers Association. Obviously, we have Ellen Satloff, who's Director of Public Relations for the NATA. We have Marissa, Marisa, Marisa Brunette from Orlando, Florida, Certified Athletic Trainer. She is the Council Chair for the NATA PR Committee. Scott Anderson, the Head Athletic, head athletic Trainer for University of Oklahoma is here. John Omquist, Athletic Trainer from Fairfax County, Virginia Schools. And obviously, we welcome you, the folks from Fox Charlotte here in Salisbury. All right. Let me, just, let me uh, introduce to you uh, Marisa Burnett. She, is work, she works for a regional, she is a regional vice president of sports medicine for core rehabilitation and sports medicine clinics in Florida. She manages the athletic trainers in their outpatient rehabilitation clinics and outreach services. She is here representing the NATA, as I said before, the NATA uh, PR committee. She is the chair. Marisa is the NATA's most distinguished athletic trainer distinction award winner. She is a member of the Athletic Trainers of Florida Hall of Fame and the Southeast Athletic Trainers Hall of Fame. Marisa, not Marissa. Thank you, Bob. Good morning, everybody. Can you see me? I am extremely excited to be here um, this weekend with you guys. This is a great group. I got a, um, a, a test run last year. And yes, Bob, I'm staying for the whole meeting uh, this year. Um, we are very proud of our partnership with NSSA. And again, I'm extremely excited to be here. We have a great group of speakers uh, for our seminar today. And last night, listening to your panel discussion, uh, it hit me when Coach Penders were talking about relationships. And relationships are extremely important, as we know, in everyday life. And with athletic trainers, we feel like we are unique healthcare providers. And uh, one of our strong points is the relationships that we have with so many different people in our profession. So again, we feel like we have an unbelievable relationship between our two associations and with the media. And we appreciate uh, what you do on behalf of athletic trainers in trying to, in, in educating uh, the public in the important healthcare issues that are out there today and saving lives. And I would also um, like to point out, and thanks Dave for the segue into this, uh, as you will see in your program, uh, we do ask that you remember to please call us athletic trainer and not trainer. And um, a perfect, again, segue to that this morning, one of our speakers, Scott Anderson, was listening to a, a sports uh, news report this morning, and they were talking about a trainer giving out drugs to one of the horses. And 
you know, again, uh, that is a misconception that every time we get on a plane to go somewhere, when we're talking to the public, you, you tell them you're an athletic trainer, and they're, oh, do you train horses, or are you a personal trainer? So again, we appreciate all that you do in using the correct terminology and helping getting the um, health care issues, the important health care issues out there that we as athletic trainers work with and take care of on a daily basis. With that, um, I am here to present the NATA Excellence in Sports Medicine Reporting Award. This is our 12th year um, uh, presenting the NSSA award winner. And as Bob said, this is our 10th year with the symposium. Morgan Fogarty of Fox Charlotte, WCCB TV. Morgan is receiving a $500 check plus travel expenses and a beautiful plaque for her office. Morgan's winning entry was a news report on the importance of baseline concussion testing in the Charlotte Mecklenburg school system. So at this time, I'd really uh, appreciate you guys putting your hands together and helping me congratulate this year's NATA Excellence in Sports Medicine Reporting Award to Morgan Fogarty. Uh, very quickly, I want to say thank you so much for this award. Thank you to my boss, Ken White, um, who I'm pretty sure this is more important than had I won an, <laughs> a Murrow, a Pulitzer, or an Emmy. So thank you for being here. I also want to introduce Carlos Martinez. He's the photographer who worked with me on this report. 50% of the credit goes to him. Carlos, thank you for your help and shooting and editing. And doing oh, uh, yeah, uh, this story was... Uh, something that you know the subject was a student that had got a concussion playing soccer of all sports and uh i'm just glad that uh, we got to report on a on something that's in place for these uh concussions to be diagnosed at an early stage and uh inform parents out there that there is something that can prevent uh you know further damage to someone's uh brain <laughs> thank you thank you so much Our first speaker is John Omquist. He's the Athletic Training Program Administrator for Fairfax County Public Schools. He oversees 25 high schools and over 50 certified athletic trainers as they provide health care to Fairfax County High Schools up in Northern Virginia. John received the NATA's Athletic Training Service Award in 1997, the most distinguished athletic trainer of the year award in 2006. In 2011, he was inducted into the Virginia Athletic Trainers Hall of Fame, and this past May, he is a 2012 inductee into the Mid-Atlantic Athletic Trainers Hall of Fame. So here he is, Hall of Famer, John Omquist. Fairfax County Public Schools is a fairly large school district. It's one of the largest in Virginia, and uh, we've had some experience with that. We have about 25,000 athletes, as Bob has mentioned. But we also have a lot of coaches that were involved with the, the uh, working with these kids. And some of them are seasoned, some of them are great, some of them aren't, some of them are brand new. Some are they're still in college, some are just barely out of high school. Uh, we do have a turnover rate in Northern Virginia uh, for almost every part of the school system. Teachers, uh, kids, people, in and out, transient area. But we also have a lot of new coaches every year, and we have to go through this a lot with regard to making sure that they know what to do when things go bad. So uh, we do have a mandatory education program as well, coaches' education. I think that's really important when you're dealing with the health and safety of other people's precious commodities. And I think there's a, a little bit, it, it doesn't always uh, come across that way when you're talking to these young uh, coaches. And, and as mentioned last night at the, uh, meeting, it's, it's the relationship and, and you must do what's good for the kids. Uh, and, and they were talking more about the college athletes and they are all accomplished athletes. In the high school setting, we do have those athletes, but 
mixed up amongst a lot more kids participating in sport. Now, if you really want to look at the definition of athlete or athletic ability, not all of our kids participating really have the excuse me, have that uh, characteristic necessarily. But the bottom line is we try to educate the coaches before they get on the field with these kids to make sure they don't do something that they shouldn't do. We also have two certified athletic trainers in each one of our schools that deal with a lot of injuries and a lot of treatments. And what we're finding is that the early recognition and er dealing with these uh, injuries early uh, in their progression tend to reduce the amount of time loss, not only from athletics, but more importantly from uh, the academic world, which now with the advent of No Child Left Behind, and you know, the, you guys have done a great job with concussions uh, and making the public aware, that's the one injury that truly is dealing directly with the school's responsibility of education. Because that's the one injury that affects the brain, which that has a shared role. Not only does it make you a good athlete, the brain needs to be working there too. Although there's sometimes you may question that. But the reality is we're there to uh, have the kids learn. So why aren't I talking about concussions? Well, we've talked about that a few times. But uh, we do have a lot of concussions in our area. We've done a lot of research. We've been doing research for since 1997. Uh, we do uh, neurocognitive testing. Uh, we do a very uh, detailed uh, level of not only sideline assessments, but also the post-clinical assessments, determining whether it's what the management plan will be for concussion management, as well as the um, uh, outcome with and working with the teachers in dealing with concussions, because that's another big thing. We've seen a steady increase. We published an article in Journal of Athletic, or a Journal of um, American Journal of Sports Medicine a couple of years or a year ago, uh, with a 10-year trending. And since 2008, when that 10-year trending ended, article ended, we still see a sharp rise in concussions, number of concussions. And I want to thank you, the media, because we've been trying to do as athletic trainers, and, and trying to bring this information to the public, to the kids, to the coaches, to the teachers, to the administration, and to the parents. But really, you guys buy ink and barrels, if you, as a saying, and, and you get the word out to, to the public a lot greater than we can. And, and I can, we, can even, we even have uh, stats that show that and prove that. But the bottom line is, why do we need emergency action plans? And it, with concussions, it's when it's not the typical concussion. It's when the subdural hematoma occurs, which is very, 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 very rare. So you don't think about it. It's not on your radar, necessarily. Neither is sudden death. Kids usually get off the field. Even if they get hurt, they get off the field. Okay? But it's when the worst thing happens unexpectedly, and you react the right way. Okay? This is an example. Okay? This guy doesn't even know he's hurt yet. But he will in a couple of milliseconds. Okay? Now what are you going to do? Now this is not the, the typical ankle sprain. It's a little bit farther up. So these are things that we want to make sure that people are ready for. And again, with your help, not only do our high schools have emergency action plans, but our youth groups can have emergency action plans. And they're practiced so things don't go south when things go south. What is it? Well, basically, it's a script for what to do when things go bad, really bad. Okay? And they are details. Details on the specific, specific to not only the venue, but also the geographical area that you're in, the sport, the people that are involved, what's accessible, what type of EMS system do you have. In our area, we have a professional rescue uh, EMS system. You call 911. They, they're there within three to five minute response time. They're all professionals. They aren't an amateur or a volunteer at a job having to go down to the firehouse, pick up the ambulance, and drive to the school. They are already there, ready to go. And when the call comes in, boom, they're there fairly quickly. And we have, we're, we're packed. We've got hospitals all over the place. So the only problem is we also have traffic. And sometimes with the sirens, it does help get through that. Wish I had one on my car getting to work. But bottom line is, <laughs> These are all things that have to be incorporated into your emergency action plan. There's legal liability. There's a couple of cases uh, that when there wasn't a proven uh, emergency action plan or a practice emergency action plan, and things didn't go as well as it could have gone, then that also brings liability. Okay? So it's to the school system or the amateur youth groups, 
best interest to do what's right and to make sure everything is set up so it runs best as possible. There's also some state law requirements. Even in our law in Virginia with concussions, there is a component in there that you have to have a plan in place. And that's good. Nine, we have over 1,500 concussions reported this year, this school year alone in our system. And we have not had any, this year we have not had any subdural hematomas or skull fractures. Now, two years ago, three years ago, we did. Okay? But these things do happen, and we got to make sure we do the right thing, because when that stuff happens, you need to get them to a hospital real quickly. And that brings up the, uh, the science behind it as well. Okay? There's some manuscripts written. These are peer-reviewed journals. And they, they show the importance as well as what methods work best and what things to include. And truly, it's athlete safety, because what's it all about? It's the kids, keeping the kids safe. These happen to be my two little monsters, and they, you know, we, they are my kids, not the coach's kids, but I want them to be safe everywhere they go. There is an assumption out there that all coaches, oh shoot, if they're the coach, in the kids' minds, in their minds' eyes, the coach is what? God, right? right. They know more than the parents. They more than know, know more than the teachers. They, they, the kids sometimes will listen to the coach. Okay? And this is where we have to always make sure we hire good coaches, but they all come with different variations or, or uh, levels of experience and maturity. But sometimes things do ha bad things do happen to good people. Okay? You can do everything right and something bad still happens. But what I tell our new coaches at our coaches meetings is that when you go home after something bad happens, and if you can say, I did everything I could have done, there's nothing I could think I could have done differently to make it work better, well, at least that part of guilt is off your plate. Okay? Some things, sometimes it just bad things happen. Sometimes seconds count. Anaphylaxis, for example. What, do you ha what happens when a kid that you don't know is allergic to bee stings because they just came from another country and, and moved to the United States last year and they never got stung by bees? They didn't have them where they came from. And all of a sudden, they get stung by a bee and they start to go into anaphylaxis. What are you going to do? Okay, these are the things that you have to think about and sometimes seconds do count. Because even in our area where you have a very quick response time, we always make the joke between uh, our area and DC, you know, 30 minute response time, if you're lucky in DC, if they don't get lost, you can order a pizza and get it faster than, uh, than an ambulance. But uh, it's pretty quick, but unfortunately, you can still die, okay? Anaphylaxis can still kill you within uh, five, 10 minutes. So, and the other thing to think about is, have you ever done something and then tried to do it again, reworked it, reworked it, reworked it? Now, those of you who, um, last night at the, at the uh, panel, they were talking about um, uh, the radio announcers, play by play. Those guys think on their feet. That's awesome. Once you say it, you can't think about saying it. You gotta just say it, and you're good at it. Well, that's why you're here. That's why you're professionals. But not all of our coaches you know, a lot of our coaches can do that. They've been coaching long enough. They know the area well enough. They can probably think on their feet pretty good. But not everybody does. And if you're the type of person like me who has to, when I write something up, I've got to revise it 16 times before it actually sounds decent enough to send it. Okay? So think about how it might be that if you're in a position where you have to react quickly, is there, have you thought about everything? And this is what the emergency action plan is. Thinking everything through, thinking all the what ifs, and what's the worst case scenario, coming up with your best answer, and then practice it. And then talk about it, and practice it again. And practice it a few times of the year uh, as, as the time goes on, so you don't forget these things. And just, you know, some people work better under pressure than others, okay? We talk to coaches about being a Henry Ford. What do we mean by this? A lot of people think that Henry Ford invented the car. He didn't invent the car. A car was invented, well, there's talk about 1600s uh, steam cars, but the first car was patented in the 1800s, okay? Uh, late 1800s. Henry Ford built his first quadricycle uh, in 1896, sold it and built another one, okay? But that's not what he was really famous for. What's he famous for? Assembly line, right. What's the assembly line? It's coming up with a way 
to systematically put something together to get an outcome more efficiently. And that's what made the Tin Lizzy popular to be low enough priced because you could make enough of them and it was all repetitive. Boom, 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 boom. People were doing it without thinking about it and that's what an emergency action plan needs to be. Okay? So that's what brought the prices down so that put a car in every garage. <clears throat> So, devil's in the details on these things. Obviously, we want to make sure that it's organized, sequenced, practiced. We want to be venue specific. <coughs> we want to know the address and landmarks. And one of the interesting things, when we have our coaches meetings for our new coaches every season, I, I ask them, okay, everybody ha uh, who has a cell phone ready to call 911 if they need it when they're in practice? Everybody's raising their hand nowadays, okay? What's the address? Write down on your little book what the address is of your practice location. And they all start looking at each other, looking in the air. And they look like deer in headlights. They know how to get there, but they don't know the address. What are you going to do when you call, call 911? And if you're in our area, if you're close to the Arlington County border, you could be in Fairfax County and get the, because the cell tower is in Arlington, you can get the Arlington dispatcher. You have to know enough to hear, listen to what they say. Because if they say, this is Arlington dispatch, what's the nature of your emergency? You need to say, transmit me to Fairfax. Because otherwise, you're going to go through the whole spiel, what you need, and then they're going to say, oh, wait a minute, we've got to transfer you to Fairfax. So these are things that can reduce time, and, and if you know about it and think about it. So these are the issues that we want people to think about as they go through this. And from a newsworthy standpoint, this whole emergency action plan issue is kind of like an evergreen because it, it, you have to deal with this kind of stuff for not only the concussion issues, but also for the sudden death issues, also for the sickling issues that what Scott's going to be talking about in a couple minutes, uh, and heat illness issues, extremely important in heat illness issues. Uh, rhabdomyolysis issues, so all kinds of things, and just you know, natural disaster issues. We have tornadoes and everything else going on, earthquakes. Now, now we have that to add to our list. <clears throat> so, it's it, there. These things are essential across the board. Okay, and not necessarily because you may do something wrong, but was it done as well as it could have been? And when it comes down to minutes. That's when it counts, and you don't want to be caught on the short end of that stick. So here's a little example we provide in our coaches' uh, orientation. This is before they actually take play, uh, set foot on the field. We give them templates. We write everything out for them. Again, some people can do this intuitively on their own. You give them the task, and they take care of it. Others, you give them the templates, and they have problems. So we put it out in a couple of different forms here. And we also have them think about it six different ways to Sunday. And hope, then we have them checked in with their athletic trainers at their individual school. And sometimes we farm our coaches, unfortunately, out to remote locations because our facilities are so overloaded. We have to have the soccer team go down to the church field because we don't have enough room on the, on the school campus. So those are all things that take place as well. Here's a case example, and hopefully you'll be able to, to see this. This is an aerial view of the school I spent 17 years at. And we have a couple of uh, markers here, the main gym and the main building here. Uh, and we have a stadium field. We have the practice field behind it. We have the baseball field over here. Okay, now here are a couple of things that are uh, unique, obviously, to this location. We have the west entrance off the main road, which is uh, Leesburg Pike, Route 7. Uh, and this is 77331 Leesburg Pike, Falls Church, Virginia, if you call the dispatcher. And they have an east entrance as well, uh, which is kind of off the screen here, but it's over on this side right here. And then we have uh, the 20-foot steep hill. So if you want to be on the fields, we tell them to come in the west entrance. If you want to be in the building, because the access to the main gym is easier on this parking lot, we tell them to come in the west entrance because you don't have as many speed bumps and it's a quicker access to those doors. So those are all things that help out. This is door number one. So if you don't tell them exactly where to go, where are they going to go? Door number one. Now, if you have a basketball injury in the main gym and it's at night, it's after 4 o'clock, you have two gates that are down, so you can't get from door number one to the main gym without a custodian. And then you... It, it, there's language barriers and everything else. So if I, by the time you find them with a key, it's going to be tough to get through. So you want to make sure they get to the right spot real quickly. Here are the AEDs. Know where they are right away. 
Okay? If you're on the field, this is the closest one. If you're on the field, it's because this is the lower area. Okay? So here's a case example, run some numbers for you. And we actually did this as a little um, uh, uh, grad student uh, with one of the universities we work with as a, a um, test. Let's wing an EAP compared to the let's figure it out venue specific EAP. Okay? Injury occurs starting the clock. Initial assessment, minute and 10 seconds. Side call EMS shouldn't take too long. This is a bad one, so you're going to call EMS. Access the phone, readily available, could be over in the side of the uh, practice field. It's hopefully not going to be in the car, locked in the trunk uh, by the coach. Info to information to dispatch, because it's important to you know what to say when you call 911 as well. And who's going to call it? Is it going to be the only coach that's sitting there with dealing with the injury, or is there somebody else actually going to be talking on the phone when this all happens? EMS arrives to the school. It's a fairly quick response time. They say three to five minutes, but we know better with traffic. Um, and EMS sets the athlete at 15 minutes, and they locate the emergency care card because that was in the trunk of the car of the coach. Uh, hopefully, they brought the right car that night. And uh, then we ca finally call the parents a little while later because you kind of forgot to do that. Okay. So, now let's look at a practice one. Injury assessment, uh, unfortunately we can slide this over a little bit to make sure you can see those numbers. Decide to call EMS a little bit quicker. Access the phone, info to EMS, arrives at school. So you get there quicker because they know where to go. They didn't go to door number one, then they had to have somebody chase them down and get them over to the back of the school. And they assess the athlete. They locate the uh, emergency care card well before that, has all the numbers on it. Let's call the parent right away. Okay? That's a 14 minute difference. That's the difference, can be the difference between life and death, folks. And that's what's important. Okay? So, emergency action plans, no matter what you're dealing with, when a poop hits the fan, you need to act quickly, you need to act appropriately, and that's what's important. So, that's my message for you today. You can work that into a lot of your stories. What was done? How was it done? Was anything, could anything be done differently? Do you have an emergency action plan? Is it practice? Is it a regular routine? Or oh, our coaches are well aware of what to do. They're, they've been with us for 30 years. They'll do fine. But you never talk about it. OK? So that's news. Thank you very much. We'll turn it over to Bob. I am not Bruce Springsteen, by the way. <laughs> he is not playing tonight at the depot, much to my disappointment. Anyway, our next speaker is Scott Anderson. He is currently the head athletic trainer at the University of Oklahoma. Prior to that, he was at the Tulane University down in New Orleans. Excuse me. <laughs> Scott is involved with the Center for the Athlete with Sickle Cell Trait at the University of Oklahoma. He is currently the president of the College Athletic Trainer Society. He has served on the task force for safety in football for off-season conditioning. Scott was the co-chair of the NATA Association Task Force on Sickle Cell Trait in the Athletes. He's also on the task force on, on exertional heat illness. Uh, he's recognized by the NATA as the College University Athletic Trainer of the Year in 2006. Here you go, Scott. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> So every time an athlete dies in sport, it's uh, often viewed in isolation, and invariably there is little, if any, consideration of any common threads that may tie one death to another. In review, though, an all-too-common cause uh, for uh, non-traumatic death is preseason and off-season workouts. And the question has been asked, are we training our athletes to death? And as painful as the question is, the inconvenient truth is an emphatic and unequivocal yes. We are training our athletes to death. So since 2000, NCAA football, where I live, has seen two players suffer, non, tr suffer traumatic death and 21 players dead due to non-traumatic cause. Three of the 21 died in a practice setting 18 died not in a practice or a game, but in a setting purported to be preparing those players to play intercollegiate tackle football. 
The 21 NCAA football dead reflect the four common causes of non-traumatic dead in athletes. One dead to asthma, four to exertional heat stroke, six to cardiac cause, and the number one current cause of non-traumatic death in NCAA football is exertional sickling in the athlete with sickle cell trait. And we'll tell the tale of one of the dead today. Aaron O'Neill was living his dream. He was a Division I football bowl subdivision scholarship player at the school of his choosing. His dream became a nightmare as he died following a voluntary workout. A quiet athlete who seldom complained, Aaron is described by the medical examiner as a well-nourished 19-year-old in excellent physical condition. The workout, divided into six stations, commences. It's a sunny afternoon with a temperature in the mid-80s. The team is in the latter stages of summer conditioning in preparation for preseason practices in less than a month and a season of promise that follows. Aaron completes the first four stations as directed. 45 minutes into the workout, Aaron is visibly weakened. He's made to repeat drills at the fifth and sixth stations because he's judged not participating at full effort. During one bear crawl, he's on his hands and knees rather than in his hands and feet. This is extremely unusual for him. He's ordered to repeat it three more times. I'm trying, he says, when told to jog and not walk back into line. I'm weak. I can't go on. Or I'm not weak. I just can't go on. A coach recalls thinking Aaron has pushed too hard, and there's a time the drill should be stopped. An hour after its conditioning, team, the team practice ends, and, and the team stretch begins. Teammates... Teammates see Aaron as unsteady and wobbling, and that he repeatedly, repeatedly loses his balance during the stretching exercise. He complains to a teammate and a coach that he can't see, and his vision is blurred. He joins his teammates in a huddle for a team break. As the coach makes announcements, Aaron leans on a teammate's shoulder. He's heard to say, oh gosh, and then he goes to the ground, slowly first on his hands and then on his knees. And finally, he lay down on the field, an unwritten violation of an unwritten rule. Aaron has never done this before. At this point, the strength coaches move the players so an athletic trainer can evaluate him, but nothing is done. Aaron is down for about 45 seconds. No complaints, just fatigue, according to the athletic trainer. Aaron is deemed recovering, and the athletic trainer has seen this many times. Aaron begins walking to the locker room, assisted by a teammate. There's concern his performance, along with that of several other players, will create negative publicity, so the strength coach gives attention to a small group of reporters who saw the workout. Upon arriving in the locker room, his condition worsens. Aaron collapses, saying he's too exhausted to get up. A strength coach states that he looks like he's drunk or he's passed out. Aaron is not talking. The teammate pours water on him and gives him water to drink. He spits it out. They slap his face to try to rouse him. He's deep breathing, gasping, and moaning. The coach and teammate try to get him up, but cannot because Aaron is limp and cannot assist them in picking him up off the ground where he lay. The institution's emergency action plan dictates calling 911 when a situation is deemed life-threatening. The landscaper and his truck are flagged down and enlisted to help. Aaron is carried out of the locker room by the, by the teammate and coach with great difficulty. He keeps slipping through their arms as they try to lift him up off the ground. The hospital's across the street. They drive to the sports medicine facility. Aaron's body's so limp, they have difficulty holding him up. Upon arrival at the sports medicine facility, Aaron is now unconscious. He has a weak pulse and then none. An athletic trainer applies an AED, but no shock is advised. The 911 call is made. The ambulance arrives at the sports medicine facility, and Aaron is now in full cardiac arrest. Aaron arrives at the hospital in the ambulance, and at 4.05, Aaron is pronounced dead. His post-mortem reveals a positive sickle cell trait status 
heretofore unknown. A battery of toxicology tests rule out anabolic steroids, performance enhancing supplements, any product with ephedra or pseudephedrine, alcohol and other drugs as contributing factors to his death. Aaron was deemed not even dehydrated. The cause of death is ultimately attributed to acute exertional rhabdomyolysis associated with sickle cell trait. The cascade of consequences that result in death for the athlete with sickle cell trait is due to fulminant rhabdomyolysis, which is an explosive breakdown of skeletal muscle tied to sustained intense exertion. And we can describe those steps as easy as one, two, three, with a caveat. Number one is the exertion is intense and sustained, hard enough and long enough to drive blood oxygen low enough to sickle. As the red blood cell dr delivers oxygen to the muscle, it can sickle. And in its sickled shape, it elongates, becomes more rigid, and takes on an adhesive property. The sickled cells can stick to cell walls and other sickled cells. And as this occurs, they can log jam the blood, ve the, log jam the blood vessel, cutting off the flow of blood to the muscle. Number two is, as the exertion continues, despite the restrictive flow of blood to the muscle, rhabdomyolysis, that breakdown of skeletal muscle, begins. The longer the athlete continues, the more rhabdo his muscle continues to break down. As the skeletal muscle breaks down, it releases toxins into the bloodstream, myoglobin and potassium. Myoglobin affects renal function, and potassium affects cardiac function. The caveat in the 1, 2, 3 scenario is a 2A, and if the lactic acidosis and the release of potassium are profound, they can stop the heart before myoglobin plugs the kidneys, and death may occur in an hour or less. Should myoglobin plug the kidneys, potassium can't go out in the urine. The potassium builds up in the blood, elevates in the blood, triggering ventricular fibrillation. The heart stops, and death occurs. Exertional sickling is an injury whose insult is intensity. It's an injury from too much, too fast, for too long. And consider there's invariably a modifier that elevates the intensity of the activity for that athlete on that day. And modifiers such as asthma, illness, environmental stressors such as heat and altitude, the push, push, push of a coach, even heroic effort from the athlete. One cannot interpret these factors as beyond our control. The truth is, all of these modifiers are controllable to a degree. And the base insult remains intense exertion in the face of sickle cell trait. 23 athletes have died in our time frame of reference. Not all are football, two were boxers, one was an NCAA track athlete, one a D2 basketball player. Not all were male. One female high school basketball player is in the number. It would seem logical that cause would be sought, but uh, answers are often hard to come by as the dead tell no tales and the living often seem loath to ask the questions. But the evidence is clear. There is a danger, and the danger is intensity, irrational intensity. There's a smoking gun of cause for exertional sickling, and other non-traumatic death in our working athletes. We know why they're dying. Pseudosports science is, is, is not only a glaring voice of validity for current sports conditioning, but is parentally placing our players at risk. There's obvious absence of science for why we do what we do in conditioning for sport. Foremost are work as the lack specificity. James Moriarty, MD, the head team physician for the University of Notre Dame, and a past president of the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine has pointed out that football conditioning is antiquated, scientifically unstudied, and can be obviously dangerous. And even in instances where there has been a defense of science basis, even a cursory view pans the plea, as does professional peer review. The physiology of exercise is proven and presently available for enhancing performance and safety for those who seek it. Intensity too soon is often a factor and violates a principle of transition. While not all of the athletes dead to, due to exertional sickling died in the early days of training, moderation in exercise and fitness confer a margin of safety to the athlete with sickle cell trait. Intensity too soon in a 
in a workout regimen creates risk exposure to all, but in particular the unfit, the unacclimatized, and those carrying risk factors such as sickle cell trait. The tendency towards too much, too fast, for too long transforms the exercise from performance to punishment. It ignores the real world work to rest ratio. It infuses irrational intensity into the drill that results in making the activity irrelevant to sport as neither success nor failure in the, in the drill dictates ability or inability to play the game. Workouts gone wild create risk with no measurable benefit. Our habit of pushing to the limit in an errant belief there is no limit is born in a misguided belief that we are mirroring sport when we have merely manufactured intensity absent any sport specificity. And one of the ironies is those meeting the goal of giving their utmost often invite the greatest risk. In our trials to toughness, the 110 percenters are at a greater risk and there's safety for those who skate by. The, how ironic we're punishing the very players that we purpose to reward. Restricted recovery is a figurative and literal, literal nail in the coffin as well, as, a common, as it's a common compromise in our faulty training practices. Constraining rest and work rest ratios proclaims pseudo sports science. Rest and recovery fosters the physiology, restricted rest and recovery fosters the physiology of exertional sickling. Rehydration with its documented benefits is compromised as rest and recovery is denied. Intensity is elevated in, infer, in inverse proportion as recovery becomes limited, and so, so too is our risk of fatality. Another common thread in non-traumatic collapse and death is sessions that lack a script or go off script. The ad-lib nature of our activities, where there is no plan or the plan is abandoned, stand in stark opposition to scripted daily, weekly, monthly progressions of volume, density, intensity, and periodization with work-risk ratios representative of sport that gain both science basis and an expanded margin of safety for our athletes. And always in fatal and non-fatal collapses in training for sport, there's the rush to implicate the player, but invariably there is no supporting evidence. Exertional cycling is occurring in otherwise healthy athletes. Even as this point of personal health information is known, wherein individual precautions can be made, those risks, along with signs and symptoms, have been ignored, accommodations have not been made, and tragedy has ensued. Dubious diets and weight loss regimens place players at risk as well. One who was overweight and his was in his third workout of the day, reportedly at midnight. He was to be on the bike for 30 minutes, and at the 10 minute mark he complained it could not go on, but there was 20 minutes on the timer. Push through and finish were his instructions. His coaches reportedly attempted to revive him and initiate CPR once he collapsed. The ambulance arrived, but following resuscitation attempts at the hospital, he was pronounced dead, the cause of death, exertional sickling. Ignorance, it seems, is an excuse. It's certainly admitted. And lack of familiarity is admitted respecting the potential complications for the working athlete with sickle cell trait. There exists misunderstanding about factors of onset, management as it occurs, differential diagnosis of exertional sickling versus other causes of collapse, the result in otherwise potentially preventable death. When it comes to coaching, it doesn't get much more old school than Bill Mallory. Coach Mallory has the unique perspective of having been the head football coach when two exertional sickling deaths occurred, Polly Portier at Colorado and Parnell Silvio at Indiana. People just aren't aware. Coaches and doctors and athletic trainers are a lot better, but the way we're conducting conditioning at this time is putting some people at risk. And following the exertional sickling death of Eric Plancher in a winter conditioning session, Coach Terry Bowden opined, quoting, off-season drills are supposed to get you in shape and improve your football skills. They're supposed to teach you about discipline and get you ready to play a game. They are not supposed to cost you your life. Sometimes bad things just happen. Sometimes people die for no good reason at all. 
But why does this sometime in college football almost always seem to be during some form of off-season conditioning? If football is practice is supposed to simulate the actual intensity of a game and the level of effort demanded in a mat drill is no different than what is expected on the playing field, then why are kids dying in March and not in September? There's no reasonable expectation of death while playing football, so why are lives being lost preparing for the game? Maybe these tragic deaths are not inevitable. Maybe it's time to start asking ourselves different questions. Are we demanding much more from these athletes than is required to safely play? Coaches must always remind themselves that toughness is the means to an end and not the end itself. Pushing a kid to the point of exhaustion and then pushing some more is a great way to test toughness, but it may have little to do with preparing for a football game. More is not always better. We need to rethink off-season demands. We're not seeing these types of unexpected deaths during the regular season or spring football practice. Perhaps it's because we're getting our kids ready to play football and not getting them ready for mortal combat." End quote. The National Athletic Trainers Association recently re-released its consensus statement on sickle cell trait in the athlete. Initially, initially released five years ago, it was released again as an opportunity to expand the margin of safety for these athletes based on knowledge, education, and precaution. Some key points are that sickle cell trade status is a preeminent point of personal health information that should be made readily available to the athlete, the athlete's parents, and the athlete's health care providers, specifically those providers responsible for determination of medical eligibility for sports participation. Athletes with sickle cell trait can and should be encouraged to participate in sports at all levels of competition. And the consensus statement is strong on moderation and activity as mitigating intensity and providing an expanded margin of safety for these athletes. And research subsequent to the initial release of the consensus statement supports this standard. There is a grave risk to the working athlete with sickle cell trait. Recent research reveals an NCAA Division I football player has a 37-fold higher risk of exercise-related death versus those without a sickle cell trait. And in the decade of study, one in 827 NCAA Division I football players with sickle cell trait died in a conditioning workout. I think there could be no more defining and direct evidence for attention to the tenets of the consensus statement. Again, confirm sickle cell trait status. All 50 states in the District of Columbia screen for sickle cell trait at birth, but databases have, have not been established for retrieval of the natal testing results at a later date. In some cases, the results are, the records are destroyed prior to availability to, to the athlete as a young adult. And in fact, in one survey, only 37% of families were told of a positive newborn test. Uh, for sickle cell trait. There is research concluding that identification and intervention can prevent death. Data from the National Registry of Sudden Death in Athletes supports initiatives in the pre-participation evaluation to identify athletes with sickle cell trait to promote precaution for affected athletes. Over the past few decades, there have been about 20 college football exertional sickling deaths. Of those deaths, sickle cell trait status was known in as few as six and as many as eight. The number of athletes with sickle cell trait deaths with screening and precaution is zero. A Division I football player has not died due to exertional sickling in over two years, and I regard this as a positive intended consequence. It's not a long period of time, but it's certainly a trend compared to a recent average of one per year dying in our program. So knowledge of sickle cell trait status begets targeted education, which begets tailored precaution, which begets an expanded margin of safety for athletes with sickle cell trait in sport. So thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. We'll open the floor now. If anybody has any questions for either speaker, please. Yes. Let me make sure I understand. There is a way to know if they have a trait of sickle cell, right? Correct. Um, Even if they know it, some coaches, trainers, whatever, are ignoring it if they see a sickly participant? 
it's been a combination of things. It's, it's largely a lack of awareness and understanding. Um, and that's why, that's why we took the initiative of the task force and the consensus statement is, is to begin to educate people because um, uh, e even in the medical community, there's, there's a lack of understanding and appreciation for the risks, the signs and symptoms and the precautions. And that's what we've sought to do. Absolutely. One would think that would be a priority. Uh, it, it seems pretty uh, uh, straightforward, but uh, that's not how th things go sometimes. Um, what, what we have found, uh, certainly in our population at the University of Oklahoma, is that the parents are aware, uh, but invariably the athlete is not. Uh, we've, uh, we've had uh, probably out of about 22 uh, football players that we've identified, uh, only two of the players knew they had it. In one case, the parents uh, did not know but invariably a parent knows they just never communicated it to the athlete. Ma'am, my son is 13 years old. He was tested at birth. I was not told his result. It is not on his pediatric record. It would be if he tested positive. Yeah, it's it's predominant in the African American population. It's uh, it's more malarial than anything. It's uh, it uh, it's predominant in populations whose origin is areas where malaria is predominant because it's protective against malaria. And and there's a and there's a difference between sickle cell trait and sickle cell anemia uh, as well. And and that that often gets to be a point of confusion. It, it is not anemia. It's trait. It's generally regarded as a benign condition, meaning it is not a disease state. There are no health issues that come with it. It doesn't carry a shorter lifespan, et cetera, et cetera. The, the primary thing for our athlete population is this risk that comes with intense sustained exertion. Thank you very much. We appreciate your attendance. And once again, we would like to first congratulate Morgan on her award. Thank you to Ellen and Marisa and John and Scott uh, for, again, informative presentations and to Bob for, for being our go-to guy here in, uh, in Salisbury and, and bringing that to you today.